Section 37 of A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume 4, by Henry Charles Lee. Book 8, Chapter 8, Part 5, Spheres of Action sorcery and occult arts valladolid furnishes similar examples of leniency in sixteen twenty nine isabel garcia a married woman under trial confessed that to regain a lover she had invoked the demon who appeared in human shape when she entered into explicit pact with him and performed various other sorceries yet she was sentenced only to abjure de levy and to four years exile from valladolid and astudia the next year gabriel de arroya under pressure from a confessor denounced himself and stated that carried away by the passion of gambling he had during the last seven years gone five times into the open fields and invoked the demon to give him money for stakes promising in return to devote his first child to the demon and offering to sign with his blood a pact to that effect it is true that the demon never appeared nor did he get money that seemed to come from such a source in the consulta de fe some of the members pronounced him to be vehemently suspect others lightly but it was finally voted to suspend the case without sentence and to reprimand him in the audience chamber there is contrast between these and some cases in sixteen forty one gathered in by a valladolid inquisitor during a visitation in astorga eight old men and women curanderos whose offences consisted in superstitious cures of the most harmless character were arrested and brought to valladolid where they were confined for months in the secret prison to be finally sentenced to more or less prolonged exile their simple ministrations being characterized as implicit pact with the demon on the other hand the licentiate pelayo de ravanal cura of anicio who charged twenty-three reals for blessing and ineffectually sprinkling with holy water a herd of sick cattle and who failed in a superstitious cure of a husband and wife was not arrested but was privately summoned and reprimanded in the apartments of the senior inquisitor there were also two cases of loberos practitioners whose speciality consisted in preserving sheep from wolves one was macias perez a shepherd of medina del campo accused by ten witnesses of having the wolves at his command and using them to injure whom he pleased five testified that he had threatened them with the wolves and that consequently many of their sheep had been destroyed the other juan gutierrez of baradilla speculated on his neighbors who gave him grain kids sheep etc to preserve their flocks the calificadores held this to be implicit pact but although both were arrested both escaped with reprimands the same moderation was exhibited by the tribunal of toledo in a curious case in sixteen fifty nine juan severino de san pablo of wilna in lithuania was living as a hermit in the sierra morena he had a skull which he had laboriously inlaid with silver images this he exhibited and gave certificates as cures for tertian fevers after his trial had been carried to the accusation it was suspended he was severely reprimanded and threatened with a hundred lashes for relapse the skull was buried in consecrated ground but not until the silver had been carefully removed and given to the receiver in part settlement for the culprit's maintenance in prison there are two colonial cases which illustrate the capricious character of these judgments in seventeen sixty at lima a guinea negro slave named manuel galliano aged seventy was tried as a curandero 
several cases were in evidence in which he had cured swellings that had baffled the faculty by making a small incision inserting a hollow cane and sucking out blood which would be accompanied with maggots scorpions lizards snakes and the like after which he would apply certain crushed herbs it was decided that this inferred pact with the demon he was arrested and freely admitted the cures explaining that he hid the animals in the cane and blew them forth as though they had been drawn from the swelling he had pronounced the patients to be bewitched and received four or five pesos for the cure he had also pretended to give a charm to another slave the case was simple enough but the trial was prolonged for three years during which he lay in prison to be finally sentenced to appear in an auto with the insignia of sorcery and a halter to vergüenza and to five years counted from the time of his arrest of service in a hospital in wholesome contrast to this was a similar case in mexico in seventeen ninety four juana martinez was an indian aged forty married to a mulatto she made her livelihood as a curandera using a decoction of the root of a plant known as palo de techer or peyote which she gathered with the invocation of the trinity and three signs of the cross ceremonies which she repeated when administering the remedy and she said that her patients ejected from mouth and nose insects flies etc which was a sign that they had been bewitched she also had an image of the virgin which she kept in a little reliquary and declared that it performed miracles in short she was an accomplished embustera and she richly earned the designation in the accusation of a simulator of miracles mariano de la piedra palacio cura and ecclesiastical judge of their village temasunchale arrested the pair and sequestrated their little property by active threats of scourging he elicited a confession that she had invoked the devil who appeared and taught her the art and that she operated by his power it was a clear case of sorcery and he handed them over to the inquisition the long journey to mexico was performed handcuffed and they were consigned to the secret prison july twenty two a little skilful pressure brought juana to admit that both the miracles of the virgin and the insects voided by her patients were impostures the fiscal chanced to be somewhat of a rationalist and on august fourth he presented a report of a character not unusual in the inquisition he pointed out that the consummate ignorance of cura mariano had already caused these poor creatures sufficient suffering in tearing them from their home defaming them arresting them obstreperously and sending them to the prison of the tribunal without reason or justice it was he who was to blame for their ignorance was attributable to him whose duty it was to instruct them assuming then that there was no legal basis for prosecution and that their lies were sufficiently punished by what they had endured the fiscal suggested their discharge with orders to abstain in future from cures and miracles under pain of rigorous punishment while the cura was to be warned to avoid future meddling with what pertained to the inquisition he should also be told to restore to them the mare and colt which he had unlawfully embargoed to send at his own cost proper persons to conduct the prisoners comfortably home and moreover that he and his vicars must see to the proper instruction of his flock the tribunal was not prepared to rise to this height of justice but it discharged the prisoners and notified mariano to return to them the mare and colt and whatever else he had seized without charging for their keep and further to present himself to the tribunal on his first visit to the capital yet notwithstanding the sanity of the conclusions reached in this case there was no surrender of belief in the reality of sorcery and of demonic influence far more effective for the suppression of sorcerers was the position assumed in seventeen seventy four 
by the Inquisition of Portugal under the guidance of Pombal. In its reformed regulations, it takes the ground that malignant spirits cannot, through pacts with sorcerers and magicians, change the immutable laws of nature established by God for the preservation of the world, that the theological argument of cases in which God permits such spirits to torment men has no application to legislature or law. Those who believe that there are arts which teach how, by invocations of demons or imprecations or signs, to work the wonders ascribed to sorcerers, fall into the absurdity of ascribing to the demon attributes belonging solely to God. Thus the two pacts, implicit and explicit, are equally incredible, and there is no proof of them in the trials, which for two centuries have been conducted by the Inquisition, save the unsupported confessions of the accused. From this it is deduced that all sorceries, divinations, and witchcraft are manifest impostures, and the practical instructions, based on these premises, are that offenders are not to be convicted of heresy, but of imposture, deceit, and superstition, all of which is to be pointed out in the sentence without giving the details as formerly. The penalties imposed are severe, scourging, the galleys, and presidio, while if any one defends himself by asserting that these practices are legitimate, that a pact can be made with the demon, and that his operations are effective, he is to be confined without more ado in the Hospital Real de Todo os Santos, the insane hospital. The Spanish Inquisition was too orthodox to accept so rationalistic a view of sorcery, and continued to prosecute it as a reality. In 1787, Madrid was excited by an auto in which an impostor named Cocho was sentenced to two hundred lashes and ten years of presidio. He had thrived by selling filters to provoke love formed indecently of the bones and skin of a man and a woman, for which he had numerous customers, including ladies of quality. The affair abounded in lascivious details, which, when inscribed on the insignia hung in the church, caused no little scandal. In 1800, Diego Garrigo, a boy of thirteen, was prosecuted by the Seville Tribunal for superstitious cures, when, probably on account of his tender years, he escaped with a warning. In 1807, the trial in Valencia of Rosa Conejos shows how the insatiable credulity of the vulgar was fed by the inexhaustible ingenuity of the impostor. She had been giving instructions as to charms by which supernatural powers could be gained, for the character of which a single example will suffice after eleven o'clock at night place on the fire a vessel full of oil when it boils throw in a living cat and put on the lid at the stroke of midnight remove it and inside the skull of the cat will be found a little bone which will render the person carrying it invisible and enable him to do whatever he pleases the bone will ask what do you want but if carried across running water, it will lose its virtue. Under the Restoration, cases become less numerous than of old, but there is no change in the attitude of the Inquisition. In 1818, for instance, the Suprema, on February 12th, ordered the arrest and imprisonment by the Seville Tribunal of Ana Barbero for superstition, blasphemy, and pact with the demon and for these offences she was sentenced october fifteenth to abjuration de levi spiritual exercises six years of exile and two hundred lashes the latter being humanely commuted by the suprema to eight years reclusion in a reformatory for loose women the same tribunal ordered june seventeenth francisca romero to be thrown in the secret prison with embargo of property as a superstitious curandera and a year later june eighteen eighteen nineteen we find her sentenced to the ordinary penalties of exile 
and two hundred lashes, the latter of which were mercifully omitted by the Suprema. Belief in the virtues of the consecrated wafer was as lively as ever, and prosecutions were frequent for retaining it, as that of Doña Antonia de la Torre, in 1815, by the Granada Tribunal, for taking repeated communions in a day, retaining the forms and converting them to an evil use. Treasure-seeking was not forgotten. In 1816, the Santiago Tribunal discovered a book of conjurations for the purpose, which was promptly prohibited by edict. All copies were to be seized, investigation was ordered into popular beliefs, and Fray Juan Cuntin y Doran was prosecuted for using the conjurations. This probably led to the discovery in 1817 at Tulida of a similar MS work, which the Suprema ordered to be suppressed. It is easy to understand that the prosecution of sorcery constituted a not inconsiderable portion of the duties of the Inquisition, at least during the later stages of its career. Cases were comparatively few, as long as only serious matters were held to fall within its jurisdiction, but, with the extended definition of pact, they increased considerably, and, as the business of prosecuting moriscos and Judaizers declined, its energies were more largely directed to the wise women and the sharpers, who found a precarious livelihood in the vulgar superstitions pervading the community. Thus, in the Toledo record, from 1575 to 1610, out of a total of 1172 cases, there are only 18 of sorcery, or a trifle over one and a half percent, while in the same tribunal, from 1648, to 1794, there are a hundred out of a total of twelve hundred and five, or about eight and one-third per cent. Occasionally they furnish the chief part of the business of a tribunal. In the Valencia Auto of July 1, 1725, fifteen of the eighteen penitents were sorcerers, and in that of Cordova, December 5, 1745, there were five out of eight a record of the business of all the tribunals from 1780 to the suppression in 1820 furnishes a total of 469 cases of which 116 may be classed as maleficent and 353 as merely superstitious belief in the powers of sorcery had been too strongly inculcated to disappear with the cessation of persecution a modern writer assures us that all the old superstitions flourish as vigorously as ever. Conjurations and formulas to cure or to kill, to foretell the future, to create love or hatred, to render men impotent and women barren, to destroy the flocks and herds and harvests, to bring tempests and hailstorms. The wise woman is as potent as of yore in her control of the forces of nature and the passions of man, and the profession is as well filled and as well paid as in the sixteenth century. We can readily believe this when Padre Capa, S.J., in his defense of the Inquisition, gravely assures us that communications and compacts with the demon are incontestable and are as frequent as formerly. We have still to consider a further development of the belief in the malignant power of the demon working through human instruments, in which the Inquisition of Spain rendered a service of no little magnitude. End of section 37. Recording by Linda Johnson.